So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Japan Society. I'm Alan MacDonald. I'm a member of the Board of Directors, and I'm subbing for our very distinguished president, Sakurai-san, who is travel traveling this evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to the discussion on machines, AI, and the future of work. Today's speakers will discuss how AI will change the future of the workplace. Before we begin, I would like to thank the sponsors that make our business and policy program possible. Global leaders, my firm, City, Deloitte, and United Airlines. Corporate sponsors, Mizuho Financial Group and Toyota Motors of North America. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Mr. Junta Nakai. Mr. Nakai is currently the business leader for financial services at Databricks. He has over 15 years of experience on Wall Street and in technology. In addition, he has authored articles about AI in outlets such as Business Insider. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Nakai. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alan. Can, can, you, can you all hear me? Yes? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today and in leading the discussion and moderating the discussion. We have a very distinguished uh, panelists, but I will keep their bios really short uh, so that we can jump in and into our discussion. So uh, over on the left, we have Jim Besson. Uh, he's the Executive Director of Technology and Policy Research at Boston University. Uh, Jed Kolko, Chief Economist at Indeed.com's Hiring Lab, and Paul Dottery, uh, the CTO of Accenture. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, as we get started, I think you know, it would be helpful to lay out the groundwork about AI and how it's currently being used. And if I could start with Jim, from a, from a research pers researcher's perspective, how is AI being used today? How is it impacting everybody in this room today? Right, so this, this is a critical question. There's been an awful lot of hype, an awful lot of projections, speculations. We wanted to do some research that would sort of really nail down what's happening today with a, with a guide to thinking about what's likely to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. So I can talk about three studies that provide some insight, it's something of a window into the future. First, we surveyed a commercial startups that deliver AI products. And one of the questions we asked uh, concerned, uh, what are the benefits that your AI products give to your customers? And we asked things like, do they help them make better decisions? Uh, do they help in marketing and sales? And we also asked, do they uh, help uh, reduce labor costs? Do they uh, help automate uh, routine tasks? Uh, the, the answers we got, there were plenty, plenty of, com of these companies saw benefits in reducing labor costs, but overwhelmingly, it was much more oriented towards benefits that enhance the customer's capabilities, that let them be smarter, let them uh, do things, uh, allow even uh, you know, mid-skill workers to uh, do their jobs better. So, for instance, uh, an example, uh, if you call a Fidelity Investments, they have an, actually an AI customer service uh, bot there that will ask you a bunch of questions and it, it figures out which of their actual human customer service reps uh, is best going to be able to answer your question. That allows the humans to do their jobs much better. The second re research study we did, we, we were able to, uh, this a lot of the concern is about automation. So we, uh, it turns out that the Dutch statistical agencies have been surveying Dutch firms about automation expenditures since 2000. We got this data, we were able to get this uh, survey data uh, and, and actual census data on a you know, very comprehensive uh, set of uh, firms in the Netherlands and millions of workers who worked at those firms. And we're able to, to uh, look and see what happens. We, you know, how many of these firms are making major investments in, in automation and, and what happens to the workers afterwards. So, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just highlight a couple things. First off, it turns out a lot of automation is going on. Each year, about 9% of the workers 
were working at companies that were making major automation expenditures that year. But the, on the other hand, it turns out that um, the effect on workers uh, who leave their firms as a result of automation, it's relatively small. Uh, the first year, only 2% of the workers, uh, the incumbent workers leave. If you go out five years, that goes up to 8.5%. Uh, if you tally this up across the economy, there is a significant number of workers who leave their jobs as a result of automation, but it's way smaller than uh, the number of people who lose their jobs when firms go bankrupt or because of mass layoffs and this sort of, you know, the, some of the nor normal churn that happens in a capitalist economy these days. So it seems clear that at this time, although there's a lot of automation going on, th there's not that much of, a, of an impact. Of course, the people who, who do get laid off bear some costs, and you know, we're able to estimate that and understand uh, the, the nature of that burden, and it's significant. Uh, we shouldn't slight that. Uh, but it's, it's also clear that um, th the impact isn't it's, uh, one of these very scary things that have been uh, talked about in some of the newspaper articles. The third thing, now, so this is, that, that was about automation, and it includes all sorts of automation, not just uh, computer-based, AI-based, big data types of automation. We did another study on publicly listed firms that make major investments in information technology, and we were able to, to identify which of those investments involve AI or big data. What we find is that when firms make these investments, on average, uh, their employment goes up, not down, up about 7%. Um, for the, a the firms that use AI, uh, it goes up even more. Uh, so it's, on average, it's very clearly not a case where AI is being employed to directly replace workers. It's, it's instead, you know, the picture is one where it's enhancing their capabilities, it's making them more valuable. As a result, their firms grow and employment increases. That's really interesting. Um, Jed, we were talking about this uh, upstairs about, you know, despite some of the findings, people are very afraid um, about displacement, about job losses. Where are we actually in a historical context? So if you look back, you know, the census data, you know, do we actually live in a unique period of time in terms of labor and, and automation? So there is a widespread perception uh, that change is faster today than it has been before or ever, um, and that the turnover in types of jobs and the way the economy is changing is making it harder and harder for people to keep up. Um, in fact, uh, if you look way back, um, and U.S. Census data uh, lets you look at this back uh, all the way to the 1860s, uh, to see how quickly the economy is changing. In other words, how, to what extent do the occupations that exist today look like those that existed 10 years ago? Um, we're actually at a surprisingly slow time uh, in terms of change, uh, much slower than what we saw, say, in the 1940s and 1950s uh, with uh, the decline of employment in agriculture, uh, the rise uh, of lots of kinds of office work, uh, slower than we saw in the 1910s, uh, slower than most points um, in the last 150 years of U.S. history. <clears throat> I think what, when, when people raise concerns about the rate of change uh, and concerns about what technology and automation will mean, um, what they are actually responding to um, is less about a quickening rate of change, um, but I think greater difficulty in making transitions and managing that change. Uh, because at the same time, as the economy in some ways is changing much more slowly uh, than at most points in US history, um, there are other ways in which it has become harder for people to make changes. So geographic mobility is way down, uh, considerably so relative to 10, 30, 50 years ago. Um, the rate at which firms are created uh, or firms die uh, have also gone down. Um, increasingly, people are working in larger firms. Uh, so this myth of small business as like creating all the jobs, not true. Uh, so I think the, the, the challenge that people are actually responding to um, is not a quickening pace of change, uh, but rather uh, a slowing uh, in the ability to manage these changes uh, and thinking about these transitions um, is a much bigger challenge I think we face um, than the rate of change that's happening. So let's take a step further and co 
go to the, you know, the actual impact on the workers. And, and I'd love to discuss with this, Paul. How do you think as AI proliferates, do we need as a society or as companies need to reimagine the relationship between humans and machines? Um, in the book that you wrote, you talk about the concept of the missing middle. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what that means and, and how you see that playing out? Yeah, no, uh, thanks. And uh, just building on the, the, the prior two sets of comments, the, the, um, just to set the stage, we, we see AI being deployed very rapidly in companies. Um, so it's still the early stages and still not widely deployed in, in, uh, in many companies. But uh, we, we're seeing AI being deployed by companies faster than any technology we've tracked over the last 30 years. So faster than mobility, faster than the first wave of ERP software, faster than... Uh, faster than cloud computing, et cetera. So AI is moving very fast in terms of adoption, even though there's, it was still, you know, still the very early stages. And um, uh, we wrote the book. We started writing the, this book and doing this research several years ago because the narrative at the time was, uh, you know, AI is certainly going to beat us at all our games because <laughs> we had all these things going on with chess and Go and everything. Uh, and after it beat us at our games, it was going to take all of our jobs, as, as, as uh, Jim was talking about. And uh, then it was going to take over the world. You know, that, so people were concerned mm -hmm. about all these implications of AI. And we didn't believe uh, any of those were true other than the games, uh, the games point, where AI is very good at playing certain games. So we, we, wrote the, we did a lot of research and, and wrote the book. And the, there's three key findings in the mm -hmm. book. And we, we really wrote it to try to provide the right narrative on how to think about AI, because our concern was, if you have some of these misperceptions, you both talked about some misperceptions. If you have a misperception, if corporate leadership believes AI is a tool to eliminate people, they'll go find ways to do it and we'll start doing it. Mm -hmm. And if we're concerned that AI will take over the human race, we'll start building barriers to adoption and such mm -hmm. that will limit the potential of AI to solve very, very big societal problems. So we're concerned that we saw the start of the wrong moves being taken. So we wrote the book when there's the, to address that and provide the right narrative. And there's three things. One, we talk, one thing we talk about is reimagining business. And we believe we're in a, in a new stage of needing to think about how organizations work. We started with automation in the you know, 1800s, 1900s, and we moved to re-engineering with the first generation of information technology. And we think we now need to move to this reimagining mindset where the processes themselves aren't static and fixed like they used to be. They're dynamic and adaptive to human capabilities. So that's this idea of reimagining the way the processes work. The second thing is the missing middle, which is this idea that the jobs of the future look very different than, than the jobs today or of the past. And they're, it's not about humans or machines and looking at the polar opposites. It's about looking at the, how the, the fusion of the human and the machine capability and what new jobs that results in. And so we, we identified six categories of jobs that we can get into a little bit more if you're interested. I won't go into them right now. But they're broadly speaking two categories. One set of jobs that people don't really talk about a lot, which is millions of new jobs that are, start, that are starting to be created where people are needed to help AI. Not mm. developers, not engineers, but to manage AI in different ways. Mm. An example is an AI trainer that we're hiring and many companies are hiring to behaviorally train AI to have the right personality as they interact with consumers in the interaction example that Jim talked about earlier. It's not an engineer, it's a, more of a soft skill in, turn, mm -hmm. in terms of behavior. Uh, so, and then the uh, other category of jobs is where AI helps people and gives people superpowers and amplifies their, their capability and productivity. So that, that's all this missing middle idea of these new jobs that are created. And again, we believe there's millions of these new jobs. The issue won't be enough jobs, the issue will be people with the right skills to fill those jobs. Then the third point we talk about a lot in the book, which I think is a really big deal for companies, this is, is this idea of responsible AI. Because we're seeing a story, an example, almost every day of a company applying AI in a way that's having adverse results, introducing bias or other, uh, other concerns that they hadn't anticipated. And it's entirely avoidable if companies take the right steps. And I think this, there's a call to action to any organization that if you're deploying AI, you better have uh, senior leadership accountability for responsible AI and doing it the right way because mm -hmm. your engineers won't get it right. And there's mm -hmm. lots of examples of that. So those are the three things we talked about. Interesting. Um, you know, Jed, as as someone working for the largest working website, right, work website, it must be the largest, um, you, you probably have a lot of very interesting insights on what actually is happening in the labor market. So what are you seeing? What jobs are people trying to leave? What are some of the skill gaps that Paul talked about? And, and how are those things being addressed sort of on, a, on a micro level that you see on your platform? Well, there are a couple of things that we've seen recently. One is that, uh, if anything, um, there uh, has been a declining uh, sort of amount of skill gap 
um, recently. So uh, there was a lot of concern uh, during the recession uh, as unemployment rose that part of what was behind this was this growing skills gap uh, between the skills people have and the skills employers wanted. Now, um, for one thing, with unemployment rate in the U.S. Uh, below 4%, like that's pretty good evidence that there probably wasn't so much of a skills gap um, if it were, you know, if it only took a few years to correct um, that people thought. Um, but even recently, you know, we've seen, if anything, um, a uh, convergence between the skills people have among our job seekers uh, and the types of jobs and employers uh, are posting and the people that they're looking for. So I think this notion of a skills gap um, was overstated. Uh, I think people now uh, are sort of more appreciate uh, that the swings that we saw in the economy recently um, had much more to do with the economic cycle um, and less to do with a long-term uh, rise in a skills gap. Um, what we do see, though, um, is uh, because we're able to see what job seekers are looking at, what other sorts of jobs uh, people want on our site. Um, we've taken a look at people in a couple of roles where um, there are concerns about automation to see what kind of jobs they want instead. Um, so when we looked uh, first at retail salespeople, um, the kinds of jobs outside of retail uh, that they're looking at uh, include customer service jobs, uh, other kinds of interpersonal service jobs, um, jobs that are really adjacent in terms of skills uh, to retail. Um, similarly, when we looked at jobs that truckers, today, people who are currently truckers, jobs that they're looking at, um, they weren't data science jobs uh, that they were searching for. You know, for the most part, they were uh, jobs in construction um, or manufacturing jobs that involve the operation of heavy equipment and machinery. And so, you know, when we think about the transitions, you know, it is not, and, and, and by the way, I think job seekers are right on this. Like this is an accurate assessment of what are the right jobs to look for that they are adjacent jobs um, where there might be more opportunities rather than, you know, going from, you know, being a 50-year-old trucker and trying to compete um, with, you know, 25-year-old data scientists. Um, that's probably a much bigger and less plausible step uh, than those sort of adjacent transitions uh, that are more plausible. Um, and that's something that we're seeing pretty clearly um, as we look at job seekers on our site. And Jim, you know, you, you mentioned a study in Europe. Are these generally the trends that we see elsewhere as well, outside of the United States? In terms of? In terms of what, what he was talking about. Yeah, I, w I would say, to the extent that we have data, yes. yes. <laughs> I, I think that's always yeah. the, the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. That brings us to the sort of the third big topic around AI and automation, which is ethics. And you know, this is very, very open-ended. And I think people have varying degrees of what that actually means. And maybe I'll go back to, to Jed on, on this one. So, you know, automation clearly has uh, varying degrees of impact on you know, gender lines, uh, social economic lines, political lines even. So, you know, what are, what are some of the things that we're seeing uh, on a macro level? So uh, the, I think the, the research about the sort of aggregate or overall effect uh, of automation on employment has really been all over the map. Um, and you know, it's very hard to make some sort of prediction 20 or 50 years from now about on balance how many jobs will be gained or lost uh, because of AI or automation or any given technology. Um, but we can actually make much better bets uh, about how the effect will be distributed. Um, it is pretty likely that, to the extent that there is pain from automation, um, it is likely to fall more on people with less education, um, people in many goods producing industries, as well as people in more routine office and clerical jobs. Uh, and when you sort of take a look at the distribution of the occupations that are likely to be more susceptible um, to automation uh, in a negative sense, jobs that might actually be threatened um, or jobs where the task mix uh, is so sufficiently changed um, that it shifts um, who has the skills for that job, um, the burden is likely to fall uh, on certain groups. Um, in the U.S., 
uh, it's also very strongly geographically skewed. Uh, so when we think about the types of occupations um, that might be at greater risk um, from automation, um, those jobs tend to be concentrated in certain occupations, which in turn tend to be concentrated um, more in rural and smaller areas, um, more uh, off the coasts, um, much less so um, in places where a lot of this technology is being developed. Um, and it actually lines up very strongly um, with partisan differences um, in the US, uh, where uh, the likelihood uh, of uh, jobs ultimately um, being you know, routine and therefore at greater from automation, much, much higher um, in red parts of the country than in blue parts of the country. Um, and that's, you know, to this point, um, that hasn't actually shown up in day-to-day -day politics. We recently did a survey uh, of U.S. adults um, and uh, concerns about the effect of automation on jobs um, was one of the few uh, concerns about the labor market um, that was equally shared by Democrats and Republicans. So it's one of the few areas of bipartisan agreement, um, probably because there aren't really policies yet for people to disagree about. Um, you know, so we can surely look forward to you know, partisan argument about this someday, um, but not yet, um, despite the fact uh, that uh, the, you know, to the extent that there is pain, um, it is likely to be concentrated um, in parts of the country that are already struggling, um, not those that are doing well. The, the one thing I'd, uh, I'd add to that is, um, I believe uh, in the US, on current course and speed that we're at, uh, AI and the new technologies that are coming will increase inequality uh, if, we, if we don't intervene and do something differently because what's happening is those with access to the education and skills are, will accelerate more rapidly. Uh, I'm on the board of Girls Who Code, which is looking at the gender gap. If you, if you study this, the gender gap in, in, in fields like computing has been getting worse, not better, mm -hmm. until about 18 months ago. Um, and that's why you know, the work of those kind of organizations is important. If you look at access to technology in, uh, in communities where students are you know, at the poverty level, free and reduced lunch and such, many of them don't have internet access to do homework in their home in an era when computer courses are going online, so they're getting a further divide. Just a couple examples, there's many more examples, but I don't think we're providing the access to technology in a way that will increase equality. We're doing it in a way that will increase inequality, and we need a lot of intervention rapidly to make sure that we we see the innovation and the change that's coming and intervene in ways from a corporate perspective and a government perspective that makes sure we have increased access and inclusion. So, you know, we're talking a lot about sort of the perils and promises of AI, and there's obviously both, and we have to balance the two of them. Uh, you kind of alluded this, to, uh, Paul, in your, in your previous talk, but what are some of the benef beneficial ways in which AI is currently being used? Hugely beneficial ways. The, uh, uh, you know, I'm a glass half full. I can talk a lot about the risks uh, and talk a lot about the opportunities. I'm, I'm a, a cautious optimist and generally glass half full on artificial intelligence. It looked like anything else, AI is a tool. Uh, and uh, it's a technology, it's a tool. And from the invention of the axe or fire or the printing press or the PC pick your technology, uh, we've, it's, we've invented, you know, the, the power of human creativity is to invent these tools to make our lives better. And that's what all these technologies have done. And I think AI, for all the, the hype around it, it's really the same. It's a tool we can use in different ways to, uh, to create great results. So some of the things that get me really excited are uh, work we're doing, uh, that we, we talk about in the book, work in uh, the largest palm oil plantation in Asia, which is, uh, if it was written about in the New York Times recently, the the consumption of the rainforest and the sustainability issues on the planet that are being caused by palm oil uh, farms. Well, it turns out you can use drones flying over the plantations combined with video analytics using AI technology to dramatically reduce the amount of new rainforest, the new, new territory you need to increase productivity. You can h identify invasive species. You can identify where you need new fertilizer. You can identify where you're too sparse or too dense in planting and get far greater yield out of the territory you have. They used to drive jeeps through these, mu these muddy roads and survey the land maybe once a year. The drones are now flying over every, every parcel of land mm -hmm. three, every three days, and they're dynamically tuning it. So dramatic I results in agriculture. Another one in Newark, New Jersey, uh, you know, 15 miles away from here, a company called Aero Farms. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. An urban farm, no sunlight, uh, vertically stacked pods that look like a computer data center. Growing, uh, growing crops in 18 days from seed to harvest using AI to monitor 30,000 data points 
of, of every seedling until it's harvested to continually improve the growing process, employing people in a food desert in the inner city to create food that they couldn't do with atrophy of productivity without AI. And it could go into health outcomes uh, and many other things, but there's, uh, there's example after example I could keep citing in, in any industry of where AI is already uh, producing, you know, producing results and we're just scratching the surface now. So, you know, we spent talk time talking about ethics and, and the impact on workers and then sort of the next inevitable question becomes policy because, you know, for all the talk about AI, what it really impacts and important to everybody here is that it impacts humans. Humans vote. And there needs to be a policy response for that. And I would love to, to talk to Jim. You know, so you, you, you mentioned that your research indicates that mass unemployment is unlikely. Um, but there's different types of disruption that policymakers need to think about. So, you know, what are these type of uh, the issues and, and how are we going to deal with these people looking for new types of work? Right. So the thing I should have said, uh, you know, we're seeing these major IT installations uh, producing, on average, a 7% increase in employment. But that's hugely disparate. So what you find is, in the manufacturing industry, it creates loss of jobs. In services and in finance, it creates a, 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 you know, a sharp increase in jobs. So we're, we're seeing uh, a very disparate outcomes. And I, and I think people have been focusing on mass unemployment as the, the single problem, and it, that's not the likely picture. The likely picture is one where we're going to see some industries, some occupations, some regions being hurt, and others growing and gaining. And as, as these guys have both already talked about a little bit, the, the, the policy challenge is helping people make those transitions, that we need to think about new ways of uh, allowing people to learn skills, new, new forms of apprenticeship, work-study programs where uh, somebody who's mid-career can, can pick up new skills both by working at a, taking courses at a local community college and also working on uh, a shop floor somewhere. Uh, we're, we're seeing all sorts of experiments going on. Um, I'm, I'm an optimist uh, also, a, a, a moderate optimist also, but I also have a sense of history that sometimes these transitions can be very long and painstaking. Uh, if you go back to the Industrial Revolution, it took, they were solving problems of a similar magnitude in terms of how to organize a workforce to, to use this new technology. And it took many decades. Many decades, wages were stagnant. Uh, for many decades, they just didn't know how to have a, a, a functioning labor market that really uh, encouraged people to get skills, keep skills, develop skills. Uh, we're facing a different sort of problem now where uh, we're seeing some rapidity of change and we, we, and the, on the one hand, on the other hand, we have an education model where the idea was people learn their skills once when they're young, and that's supposed to last them a career. We have to go to a new form where people can learn readily learn new skills uh, throughout their career multiple times. Uh, this means a change in the education system from a philosophy of where you know where the focus needs to be teaching people to teach themselves how to learn. Um, and, and you know a variety of different experiments. We don't. We, we will be going through a, a phase of experimentation where we really find out what works in sort of making these transitions. And I think a big policy issue that I'm concerned about because I think we're, it's, a lot of people are talking past each other is who's accountable for that reskilling you yeah. talked about. So yeah. when I talk to yeah. businesses, just a statistic to share with you from the, the book is 65% uh, of executives in the 1,500 organizations we surveyed, 65% uh, of them said that uh, their workforce wasn't ready for AI. Uh, then we, the next question we asked was, how many of you are doing something about training your workforce, et cetera? Three. 65% <laughs> believe they're not ready. Three are doing something about it. And then that's not because they're evil big corporations. That, you know, we're not sure what to do. We think it's government's issue, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of similar issues are in government with you know, not focusing on the right issue. I think the, the urgent thing we need is to figure out uh, what we need to do with you know, the policy within business, but then the public-private policy with, with governments as well. One of the beliefs we have is that Every company needs to take on reskilling as a mandate for themselves because we, we see jobs that are going to change and are going to change faster than you can hire new people. So a strategy of firing and hiring isn't going to work. And the example I like to say is, is from the oil industry with a company we're working with, uh, oil field services technicians, the, the people that are putting the pipe segments in to drill uh, in, the, in, the, in different parts of the country. 
that job is changing. It's going digitally. You have sensors in the ground. It used to be just uh, a physical technician turning valves, pumping more water in, changing the rate of the, of the drilling. Now it's uh, playing a game. It's, it's literally, the interface is literally built with Unity, a gaming platform. So the, the oil field services technician is playing a game, using a gaming platform, real-time data being fed in, visualizing what the drill bit looks like underground, where it's hitting rock, where you need to turn, when, how, when the torque on the drill might cause a, a part to break, operating the drill far more efficiently. So that job is not now oil field services technician, it's gaming engine enabled, digitally skills literate oil field <laughs> services technician. You're not gonna hire that job. You, if you don't train your own people, you're gonna be at a competitive disadvantage in the way that these jobs change. And that's why we talk about these, you know, these missing middle jobs, we need to take a different mm -hmm. approach going forward. Sure. And if I can just add, um, there, in addition to policies that are directly about skills and training, um, there's also a whole world of other policies that make it easier uh, for people to make transitions um, that aren't directly about skills. Um, so uh, thinking about occupational licensing, rules that um, get in the way uh, of someone who uh, is able to practice law or nursing or other um, professions in one state but not in another state. You know, that's the kind of thing that creates a barrier to mobility um, that has nothing to do with learning new skills. Um, that's what being able to use the skills that you already have. Um, high housing costs um, in, labor, in local labor markets um, where jobs are plentiful that make it harder for people to move to um, and end up keeping them in places where jobs aren't as plentiful. Again, a policy that has nothing to do with skills directly, um, but very closely related to making transitions easier um, in a time of change. Not to mention financial support. <laughs> Yes, that's, that brings me to everybody's favorite topic, which we discuss upstairs, is universal basic income. Go. <laughs> okay, my answer. I think uh, I, I don't agree with the idea of universal basic income. I think the, univer the word universal is wrong, so there's a proposal by one of the presidential candidates to give every American $1,000 a month. I don't think that's solving the problem we're talking about. I don't need $1,000 a month for skilling. I don't think most of this audience probably doesn't. Certain people that, were, that are displaced need a lot more than that. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the issue is how do we provide the right targeted assistance to those who really need it for the skills and the access, and uh, that's the, the way we need to attack it. So I'm very skeptical of uh, any kind of uni universal uh, basic income approach because I think it, it ducks the, it's, it can be, be, can be popular, but it ducks the real issue of let's figure out how to help the people who really need the help and give them enough help to make it, make it through the transition. Right. Agreed. A very, ex <laughs> yeah. a very expensive way to give money to people who don't need it. Yeah, I, I agree also. I, and I think a lot of this has to do with people are focusing on the wrong question. Mm -hmm. It's not about impending mass unemployment. Mm -hmm. Universal income might make, basically might make sense if that really were the problem, but that's not the problem. It's this problem of, of, of inequality, of disparate effects, of mm -hmm. some people losing, at, of winners and losers. You know, and that's what we're seeing uh, the, the big impact being. I think the, the, the one reason I am glad for this debate over UBI, one of the few reasons why I'm glad for the debate over UBI is I think it has focused people on this broader question of like what's the value of work? Um, and like does it, solve, does it solve the problem to give people money in lieu of a job? Um, and you know, it has, it has caused people to take more seriously questions about ways in which work provides dignity and community and sense of meaning and so on. Um, and I'm not sure we would, I'm not sure that what would have been surfaced as clearly in the absence of this interest in UBI. That's a good point. Yeah. So we're at the Japan Society. I know, Paul, you were recently in Japan and we were discussing earlier about you know, the Japanese may have a different philosophy of automation or different attitudes towards automation than what we may be accustomed to. So can you talk up about us a little about Society 5.0, which is a, a new initiative in Japan, and so what, what are, you know, and this goes to Jim and Jed as well, what, what are some of the things we're seeing in other countries outside of the United States? Yeah, and no, I spend a, a good amount of time in Japan. We have a, a very large large business there and, and uh, with all, interest in all the same sorts of technologies and things. And uh, I, I talk about Japan specifically, but I, I'd say this issue we, that where we get so focused on jobs, I spend a lot of time in the U.S. on this. When I go outside the U.S., I spend a lot less time because mm -hmm. the issue is, is very different in, in most countries. Uh, 
But in Japan, the issue is, as, as this audience uh, will know well, is the, the issue is a, a, a shrinking uh, population and an aging workforce uh, in, a, in an export-driven uh, economy. And so the real issue is productivity. And uh, so I think the approach that Japan is taking is the right approach with the national strategy on AI and Society 5.0, which is looking at how do we aggressively embrace AI and robotics and related auto automation as a way to solve the, as a way to improve the economy, mm -hmm. uh, as well as a way to solve some of the societal problems, and that's what Society 5.0 is getting into. I think it's a, I think it's a good plan. I think the the focus on com com convening the AI resources to dedicate to it to it is a is a is a good approach, and you see some really interesting things happening. Some of our very interesting AI work is happening in Japan as a result. We just had a press release today on a new uh, AI program with Japan Airlines on uh, customer care provision and using AI in the, the customer care process to provide better service and help agents uh, learn faster to provide better services to people, just as one example. So I think, uh, I think Japan's in a very interesting spot, and I think that that might help Japan accelerate faster than other countries which are debating all the, the should we do it, should we do it, you know, shouldn't we do it, do we need to, to tax AI, should we slow down because of various considerations. Countries like Japan, countries like uh, Singapore, countries like Germany, I could list a num number of others, don't have the jobs concern you know, like we have in the U.S. They're focused on, help, um, on improving the productivity of people really quickly mm -hmm. to improve their economy and societies. You guys have any um, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think some of the, you know, in addition to differences around uh, expectations about automation and work, um, the, the sort of cross-country and cr really cross-cultural differences um, in what concerns AI raises um, are quite striking. So, um, you know, countries, you know, there are places where, you know, one of the sort of biggest applications and biggest concerns is surveillance um, and personal privacy with respect to the government. Um, in contrast, Europe um, has been a leader in thinking about uh, individual uh, data protection. Uh, and transparency in these algorithms, um, and so you know the, the the way in which you know both the production and usage of these technology evolves um, is going to reflect you know pretty significant cultural and political differences uh, that we see across the world. The, and a lot of these differences will affect how things play out. So Germany is an example where. Uh, it's one of the most heavily ro ro robotized manufacturing workforces, uh, but the study seemed to show that uh, robots in Germany have actually boosted productivity and boosted employment in the, in the long run. Um, but Germany recognizes there's some, it, it's, it's facing some very difficult problems with it. Uh, the German, a, a, a key pillar of the German educational system uh, is, is vocational education and their apprentice system. And they've recognized, that to some degree, the traditional apprentice system is not very adaptable to when new technologies come along rapidly. And they're trying to figure that out as well. So now taking it to the actual impact on businesses. So uh, to, with Jed, I'd like to ask you this question to you is, we spent a lot of time talking about the, the demand side of labor. What's going on on the supply side of labor? Yeah, I mean, when we, when we think about automation and the labor market, um, we naturally think first about the demand uh, for labor. So what does it mean in terms of uh, will employers uh, substitute technology for workers? Um, will it uh, enhance the work that people can do? Um, and that's on the labor demand side. Um, but lots of the best examples uh, historically of the ways in which uh, technologies generally, and automation specifically, um, has affected the labor market, has been through the supply side. So think, for instance, uh, about labor-saving technologies in the home. You know, the washing machine, the dishwasher. You know, these are, you know, robots of a sort. Um, they reduced the amount of hours necessary um, for at-home labor and freed up people, primarily women, to enter the formal paid labor force. Um, and contributed significantly to the overall labor supply um, and a big increase in women's participation rate. Think about technologies more generally. You know, the technology that arguably has had the biggest effect on the labor market you know, in the past 70 or so years was the pill, uh, which completely changed 
the way that women could make decisions about investing in education and career and so on. These are all um, uh, forms of technology that affected labor supply decisions. And in the same way, you know, as we talk about all these other forms of automation as affecting you know, how jobs and tasks change, um, there may be ways, for instance, um, if autonomous vehicles uh, end up freeing parents from having to drive their kids around half the day uh, and therefore uh, expand labor supply, again, primarily uh, for women, uh, but for parents generally. Um, or, uh, again, just you know, using the example of autonomous vehicles, because it's just the easiest one for me to think of for these purposes, um, if suddenly you can be productive during your commute um, in a way that you can't today if you're actively driving, again, that sort of expands the labor supply. Now, that might be bad news for wages uh, as the labor supply increases, but good news for participation and so on. My point is only that when we think about how automation might affect the labor market, um, you know, there are lots of kinds of effects um, that we often overlook um, when we are so focused on what automation means for labor demand and what happens to certain kinds of jobs. There's a couple really interesting examples. I, I, I fully agree with that. Just a couple of examples that really get me excited about this potential of using technology to, to solve these problems. There's um, uh, work we've done. It's, it's actually in India. It's uh, an organization called My Second Innings, which is looking at how to help women who have left the workforce to raise children re-enter the workforce. And a big, the two big issues are content, you know, competency around content, and then confidence. And confidence it turns out to be a big barrier to the women getting you know, re-employed. So we worked with this organization, this non-NGO that was focused on this. We developed an AI application to help women do uh, trial interviews and tests in, uh, like they would encounter at companies. Mm -hmm. And it had facial recognition, uh, emotional mm -hmm. AI, and other capabilities so that they, you could practice. And it would say, well, uh, you were weak on this question, or you, your, your eye contact shifted when you said this, which was a sign of lack of confidence, or your body posture changed. And it helps uh, the women practice and become more confident so when they go for the real deal interview, they're more confident and ready. It's having big results. And that's just one example of using, you know, using the technology, using AI, not to displace people, but to help people and help them on this you know, kind of supply side of being more, uh, you know, presenting themselves better and representing themselves better to get the jobs uh, that are out there. And there's a lot of examples like that that we've seen in some good technology that's being deployed in corporations now to help in, this, in similar ways to actually help candidates find better jobs at their companies. Uh, we're actually, what we're doing is we're expanding dramatically the number of people that can access jobs at Accenture and then using technology to help those people find the right jobs so that they don't keep applying to the wrong jobs that they're not as well qualified in their company, using mm -hmm. AI and gaming, you know, uh, gamification, other technologies to help people find the better jobs. So I think there's tremendous potential to, on the supply side and then matching up that supply and demand side. So we talked about transitioning people by teaching them new skills. Mm -hmm. AI play, is going to play a real big role in uh, helping people make those transitions, not only in helping them learn, uh, but also by taking over some of the, the, uh, the skills uh, that uh, somebody would have to learn to get back into the workforce. Um, the person doesn't need to necessarily learn them anymore or not as, as deeply. They can rely on the, on the yeah. technology more. So we have a lot of business leaders here. Um, what are some of the action items that, or recommendations that you could give to the audience based on what you've learned and what you've seen uh, being adopted at companies on, on how they should think about implementing AI automation uh, at their organizations? Maybe I'll start with Paul on this one. There's a lot of different ways to come at it, but I, I, the, the, I'd say three things. Um, that to focus on. Uh, the first is, is it, there is technology to focus on. If you're in a company, you need to understand the technology and figure out how to apply it. And it changes your technology strategy dramatically because the kinds of partners you need to access technology, the kind of data you need is dramatically different. So you see big moves like, for example, Roche Pharmaceutical acquiring Flatiron Health, spending you know, billions of dollars to get a data that, they, that helps inform their R&D processes to fuel more AI-informed uh, research, just as, as one example. Um, so the, uh, so the, the technology and the way you access uh, the strategy around partners and accessing data in, in your technology platforms is really important to think about. The second is talent, which is the right AI talent uh, 
in your organization, but more importantly, the talent beyond the AI experts, the workforce strategy, and mm -hmm. the continual learning platforms that we believe are critical for you to put in place to develop that talent, as I talked about earlier. And then the third thing I would say is, is trust. And we haven't talked about that a lot, but we're in an era where uh, consumers are already very concerned about what's happening with their information, with, you know, post-Cambridge Analytica times we live in, tech lash that's happening, and that's this is happening in China and other countries, not just the US. And ultimately, AI is giving you the ability to get more data to personalize things and do things more specifically for consumers. They're only gonna, consumers are only gonna be comfortable with you doing that if they trust you. And an example is Amazon's key service. I don't know if any of you use this Amazon's key service where you can actually let them in your house to deliver goods. And if it's groceries, they'll open your refrigerator and rearrange your shelves as they put stuff in your refrigerator. Most of you probably wouldn't trust your brother or sister to do this, and Amazon's <laughs> gonna do it. So think about the degree of trust that's built up through every interaction over years mm -hmm. to allow them to do that. that. That kind of personalized, you might say invasive service, has analogs in almost every industry. Mm -hmm. And your organization's ability to, through every interaction you have, every touch point with a customer, every use of data to demonstrate trust, we believe becomes a strategic differentiator for companies as you, as you look at the age of AI. So technology, talent, and trust. I think you guys like to add to that. Um, so two things, I think. Um, one is taking a hard look and really facing the question honestly of, where the opportunities are for AI in the business. And maybe the simplest way I think about this is, what are the processes or decisions that would benefit from more accurate predictions? Um, if you could more clearly predict what a customer is calling about, or what someone is going to buy next, or you know, which part is going to fail next, those kinds of prediction questions for which you've actually seen this happen before, um, those tend to be the kinds of problems um, that at least today uh, are um, most susceptible uh, to being improved by different forms of existing AI. Um, now, to some extent, that means cutting out questions that you might think could be answered by AI but actually have nothing to do with that kind of prediction. Um, at the same time, that could be expansive in that you might think of, oh, there's something on the HR side, um, such as you know, who is most likely to be um, looking for jobs elsewhere, at greatest risk, who's the biggest flight risk? Questions that you might not think of as possibly amenable to an AI-based solution, that could be. So I think you know, asking, you know, asking the tough question across an entire business about where could we benefit from better prediction you know, is a way of probably you know, cutting out some of the inappropriate uses and identifying other good uses. Um, the other sort of piece of advice is, like, unless you are part of a handful of companies and you know who you are, um, you are almost certainly going to be in the business of consuming AI rather than producing AI. Um, so it's it's sort of like Excel, like. Almost every business uses, you know, has people who are using Excel, and it's really important to find people who are good at Excel. Um, but you probably aren't creating your own custom spreadsheet software. Um, now, Excel is a much simpler example, and I, much as I love Excel, I won't push this too hard. The bigger point, though, is it only requires a few companies to actually be producing the technology. The talent that most companies need is understanding how to use it, how it changes business processes, how it changes uh, organizational structure and other rules. Um, it is not, you, you are not going to be competing with Google or Amazon for AI talent, probably, unless you're a handful of very special companies. Mm -hmm. So consumers rather than producers. So I agree with what everybody said, except for the last point. So one of the things, I don't have the, the, the hands-on experience that somebody like Paul has, but one of the things we're seeing in the data is that companies in every sort of industry are making major investments. Uh, this is a lumpy thing. I mean, if you, if you think about the kinds of problems that Paul brought up, uh, you're not gonna go in that, into that sort of thing half-hearted. Uh, you, you're gonna make a big investment, and, and that seems to be what's happening. So they, they're buying, a lot of companies used Excel spreadsheets, but built whole customized systems around them. 
So if we look, for instance, at the number of software developers that are being hired by companies in, in, in retail trade and you know, every, every, every industry across the economy, we're seeing some companies making large investments. And on average, those, I think those are risky investments. But on average, they're, they're turning out to be successful. There's, there, there's, there's payoff there. But in a sense, it, it's, um, it, this, says, this, this suggests to me, and, I, and I, you know, this is just fragmentary or just suggestive, uh, y y you know, either play big or, or, or go home. It's, it's, you, you can't do it halfway. You, you've, got, you've got to really make a commitment. It's got to be thoroughly thought through. It, it depends very much on some of the organizational type uh, changes that Paul was talking about um, and, and concerns. Um, you're going to rely on outside sources as well, but you're going to complement them with your own software developers and your own organizational changes, I think, throughout the organization. And, and with that, the, you know, the best thing about doing a panel is the questions from the audience. So uh, I would love to open it up to the audience. Um, so we have two people walking around with mics. Um, so if you can say your name and your affiliation uh, and then ask a question, that would be wonderful. So maybe I'll start uh, right there in the front. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is George Friedlander and I work at a, a small research group. Um, I had, had spent 41 years at Citigroup um, mostly on the state and local government side, and, but I did a, a little bit of work with the Osborne Fry team from Oxford, who, who did a lot of the early future of work, work as, you, as I'm sure you all know. Um, I could have a dozen questions. I'll limit it to two. <laughs> Mercy on the rest of the audience. Um, being working with state and local governments, my concern is, is regional pressures and lumpiness of the change in work and that concerns me in particular with the seemingly accelerating transition on the mobility side that is being driven in part by climate change is going, and is going to get more rapid from everything I, I read and hear. Um, less oil, less cars, um, more car sharing, more automation, automating of jobs. Things related to mobility worry me in terms of at least the transitional issues until you get beyond it. And then going in all the way in the other extreme, uh, a concern, uh, something that Oswin Fry wrote quite a bit about was third world country issues as there, some of those jobs get moved over to Germany and automated and, robo and, and turned robotic. And as they called it, the ugly phrase, premature deindustrialization. But it makes sense to me as a worry that we in the US don't worry very much about that if a lot of things can be automated and taken back to where the demand is, that those are worries for Africa, for Indonesia, for and, and on and on and on, uh, where, where there are, is cheap labor that can be substituted with automation. So I, I took this in two extremes, and I apologize. But one's the US. One, and the lumpiness of the potential change in, in employment in particular related to all the things in mobility that are going to be changed inevitably, at least in part, by climate change. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I, can, I can start in the mobility um, piece. Uh, so I think it's useful to uh, separate um, the kind of mobility that I think is important for broader transitions in the labor market, and that is um, mobility between labor markets. Um, so the mobility that enables people to go from where jobs may be scarce uh, or low paying to where jobs are more plentiful or better paying. Um, and I think that's, that's what we've seen a huge decline in um, in the US. And I think that is, you know, again, partly a housing policy issue. Um, it is also, um, an issue, lots of other sociological factors behind it. Um, it's not primarily a technological issue. Um, in contrast, the other piece of mobility that I think is relevant to all this um, is mobility within a metro area, within a labor market, um, having to do with um, you know, the you know, cost of oil and gas, um, the ability to get to work, 
Um, that's, I think that's the kind of mobility um, where we will see much bigger changes that come from technology. Um, it is also a kind of mobility um, that is very much a distributional and equity issue, um, given that uh, there are um, many, a, a lot of the um, best paying and fastest growing industries um, are often located in parts of metro areas um, that are not accessible to people without a car. Um, and public transit is often poor. I mean, you look at Silicon Valley near where I live, and you know the big tech companies have essentially set up their own transit networks, um, the Google buses and so on, um, because uh, the, uh, an absence of intra-metropolitan mobility. Um, and so I think, you know, both kinds of mobilities are concerns. Um, they're actually quite different in terms of uh, the, both the source of the problem um, and the potential solution. My hunch is technology will actually do a pretty good job at solving the intra-metro mobility. I think you know, the more we get to uh, uh, transportation innovations, you know, it will make commuting easier, might encourage sprawl because it makes it easier to commute longer distances. But I think the ability to move between local markets and reduce some of those um, barriers across regions um, that's when the technology won't solve, and that's really a difficult um, policy and political issue. I'll, t I'll talk to the second question. Uh, two, two, two things. One is, first off, premature deindustrialization is a real concern. Uh, it, I, it was highlighted by Danny Roderick, I think, uh, first. But it's been going on for quite a while and isn't something that just relates to AI. It, it relates much more to trade. Um, so it's, it's a story where developing nations, um, once they open up their markets, uh, are getting cheap foreign goods in, which makes it difficult for them to industrialize on their own. There's a, there is a real threat that these new technologies in developing nations uh, may somehow accelerate that, that problem. Um, we don't really know how to deal with it. We don't know much about what's going on. We do, there is some evidence uh, about automation taking place in developing countries themselves. Uh, apparently there is quite a bit of automation going on. Uh, the, the World Bank did a, a survey study, uh, but they found um, it wasn't necessarily hurting employment uh, in those nations. Um, so it, I, I, that's just one study, it, it, you know, it's not, not a definitive answer on what's happening, but um, you know, we're, we're starting. To, I think I think you're raising an important question, and we're just sort of starting to get fragmentary pieces in. Yeah, the only thing I'd add on that on that on the developing economies point, I, I think it's more of a talent issue than an infrastructure issue. Uh, in that, uh, in, in, I say that because if if you look at the the way that a lot of AI will be spread, it's through lar the large platforms, which you know the, the Googles and uh, Microsofts and Amazons of the West, or the Alibaba's and Tencent's and Baidu's of, of, of China. Um, and uh, the, the, as they spread and are spreading through all, all countries, including developing countries, it's providing access to immense capability for people who have the talent. So you can be in, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and have access to Alibaba's uh, cloud in, in certain spots that, and that'll spread more rapidly, which gives you amazing AI and automation technology capability very inexpensively if the local if people in the local economy can take advantage of it. So I think it's really a, a talent issue and something we have to figure out is how do we make sure that the talent develops or maybe even skips a generation in terms of the sophistication of the, the talent to be able to use AI to compete, you know, to be competitive more on a global stage. Um, it's also, this is gonna be the very economisty kind of answer um, to this, uh, thinking about different countries. Um, it's also a simple cost issue. Um, the same robot that is feasible to deploy um, anywhere um, might make a lot more sense economically um, in a place where workers are more expensive than where workers are cheap. The kinds of coffee-serving robot cafes um, that we now see in places like San Francisco, where I live, um, make more sense where you'd have to pay workers a lot more um, than in a country where the same workers pouring coffee uh, make a fraction of the income. So 
the broader point is, you know, the diffusion of technology depends not only on what's technologically possible, but also what makes economic sense. And the cost of labor um, is a really important input in the decision uh, of whether it makes sense to deploy uh, uh, and diffuse different kinds of technology. Um, maybe that lady in the red in the middle. Hi, my name is Amanda and I work at MUFG Securities. My brother recently um, experienced AI himself when he applied for a job on ZipRecruiter. So he uploaded his resume and all of a sudden he got all these, you know, emails saying that he's going to interviews and he got, you know, um, accepted to go on these interviews. He then found out that the, they were actually a scam. So my question is, <laughs> <laughs> what are companies doing to prevent things like this from happening? So on the one hand, you have AI working. You know, they're filtering words and names from people's resumes. And then on the other hand, you have companies, scams, who are sending you to these pyramid triangle type of <laughs> work environments. So my question to you guys, is do you think that companies are actually doing things to prevent stuff like this from happening? Yeah, I think I, I think they absolutely are. But it, it's a it's a it's a never ending battle. You know, one of the phrases I always say is as a kind of I call that kind of a, as generally speaking a kind of a security issue of how somebody got access to those to your brother's data and knew that they could reroute it somewhere. There's there's a security violation in there somewhere. And there's no finish line in security because you know because the uh, all the technology we're talking about AI and everything. Some of the best uh, practitioners are state-sponsored and criminal uh, cyber organizations, and uh, and it's very advanced and it's it's getting harder and harder to defend any kind of attack, any kind of uh, incidents like the ones you described. So I think businesses are I investing more and more to try to prevent all of these things, but it's 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 not like it'll ever be done because it's a, it's it's a constant ongoing. Uh, challenge that uh, the companies will face. Um, so that that'd be my my answer. I think the it's why um, uh, it, it's why organizations need to continue to just be very vigilant and really thinking about that the cyber issues and how they defend themselves appropriately. And increasingly, we're seeing that needing to be a cross industry type of issue because um, uh, companies are uh, criminal criminal cyber organizations are learning how to penetrate one company and follow a pattern to get to another company. So if you don't, you don't see collaboration in the industry, then you can see it quickly spread across too. AI is a powerful tool for, for helping companies deal with fraud and security issues. Yeah. The, the, the first AI commercial application was actually for credit card uh, fraud, mm -hmm. det detecting credit card fraud in 1987, I believe. Um, and the application that um, you probably come across fairly often and appreciate is your spam filter um, in your email, um, which you know, spam filtering is often used as one of the sort of earlier, not earliest, but earlier um, and sort of uh, compelling and clear examples of the way AI works by essentially pattern recognition uh, of learning over time, um, partly because you are tagging things as spam um, and it's learning over time um, what are the characteristics common to incoming emails that are spam. So, um, I mean, I'm, and speaking for companies generally, just to make clear, I'm not speaking for the company I work for, for companies generally, um, huge efforts, um, fraud teams um, using AI, because it's, you know, it is not possible for a human to read every email coming in and determine whether it's spam or not. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is, you know, one of the many kinds of ways in which companies think about um, the uh, risks from AI, um, ways in which AI raises ethical issues, um, but also that AI is itself useful for, com for combating a lot of this. Um, so maybe all the way in the back, the gentleman right there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking about the, uh, the instance where Amazon comes to my house, it looks in my refrigerator, <laughs> when it's putting my stuff in there, and it's, it says, oh, you're out of yogurt, I'm gonna order you three yogurts. Oh, you're out of milk, I'm gonna give you three milks. And 
I also think about the instance where I'm traveling and my, I haven't informed my credit card company and so the first thing that happens when I get off of the plane, I try to buy a cup of coffee, my credit card doesn't work. Um, and then I was thinking about how human beings get where we are, how, we ha how you four are on that thing, it's, it's because you mutated from either paramecium or amoeba or something, but <laughs> spontaneous mutation over generations and generations got you where you are. As pattern recognition starts to, which is inherent in AI, starts to make choices for us, and it likely says, oh, today's Tuesday, you should have ramen. All of a sudden, I'm giving my agency up to a bunch of machines, and we lose, as a, as a species, our ability to mutate and introduce change. If Amazon is filling up my refrigerator all the time with the same brand of yogurt, how does anybody ever come out and make a new brand. What happens to product introduction in a world where our choices are constantly being made for us by algorithms? Um, okay. I think I'll, I'm just uh, a moderator, so you guys, you guys take Have that one. Yeah, I think I th um, the, uh, you, you have to think about kind of the, the, the kind of human use and the alternatives in, in this case. I think the uh, we have to choose how we want to use the technology uh, ultimately yeah ultimately and I think you could you could say in your case that that's uh, you know maybe taking some of the the creativity or the spontaneity out of exploring different uh, recipes and such but what what's the trade-off that you're getting because of that you probably you might have time available for more creative pursuits more time with your children what have you as a result so I think there's all these trade-offs and it's hard to say you know the algorithms making one thing worse because I, th I think what Ultimately, the technology is doing is, is giving us, I think, more choices and more time. One of the things we write about uh, in, in the book is, uh, is the ability to rehumanize time. Uh, technology to date, in the way we've applied it, I would argue has been inhuman. Uh, the technology we've deployed has caused us to work more 24-7. Uh, the uh, average person touches their mobile phone, in, average, in this age demographic, not to stereotype you, would be about 2,600 times a, uh, a day. It would be 4,600 times a day if you're a millennial. And you, and uh, uh, I forget the percentage exactly, it was 80 something percent of people uh, wake up in the morning and check their phone before their feet hit the floor getting out of bed. And so I would argue that the way we use technology now and the, and the way it's been deployed has been inhuman. And I think we have the potential with services that are more adaptable and flexible to what we want to do to make it more human and give us more time to make human choices and pursue human connection and human impact. And that's what we see happening in the early days of some of these new jobs. So I think we just have to be careful to make the right choices with it, but we have the, the potential to spend less of our time dealing with silly ways to use technology, like typing with our thumbs on a, a little piece of plastic that's this big, and, fi and have more time and more of our human cognitive capability to really be creative and make choices. But I think what you're raising, like, is a real concern. I mean, my, my initial reaction to what you said was, you know, yes. Um, I think there is a strong potential uh, for uh, recommendations based on paths, pattern recognition to entrench choices people make. Um, and you know, there, there, are ways that, there are ways that you could tweak the technology to reduce that. You could you know, intentionally build in a certain amount of randomness. Um, so there is sort of in, intentionality to break out of that. Um, you know, there are ways in which people already choose um, to resist uh, those kinds of recommendations, such as um, when you know people, uh, lots of people who are very active on Twitter, uh, objected to the Twitter option of uh, recommending certain tweets that Twitter was guessing you would like, uh, and instead really preferred to stick with the strictly chronological timeline, which is less optimized, but gave you more of that sort of random pellet of sort of pleasure and engagement um, that you get with just a chronological feed. Um, so there are ways to choose that. I think one of the most compelling pieces of this um, is what um, Kathy O'Neill wrote uh, about in her book, um, Weapons of Math Destruction, um, where she, this is a, a book that's thinking a lot about um, some of the concerns about AI and ways in which AI might reinforce or even introduce uh, new forms of bias, um, that there's a real risk that um, the mass, I'm going to butcher the line, but it's something like um, there's a risk that we get to a world where the masses are processed by machines um, and the elites um, are processed by humans. Um, and, you know, that's, 
that is something that you know anyone involved in this work um, should keep in mind. And there was recently, I think it was in the Times, um, the article uh, uh, "Human Touch Becoming a Luxury." Um, people saw this over the weekend. You know, in the same notion that um, you know one can opt out um, and sort of preserve a certain kind of randomness or humanness, um, but that might increasingly come at a cost uh, and therefore end up being you know a class barrier or status marker um, that you have figured a way to exempt yourself or buy your way out of. Um, you know, some kind of algorithmically mediated experience. Uh, I think that's a real concern. That's basically what's happened on Wall Street, where you have the, the majority of clients getting low touch coverage and the biggest clients getting the high touch human coverage. So uh, that's really interesting. Um, maybe right there on the, on the edge right there. Chris McRae, Norman McRae Foundation. Could I ask you to maybe give a sort of a positive leapfrog forward uh, view of AI? So, I mean, when I look at someone like uh, Masa-san in Japan, I think he's using AI more in terms of everything connecting forward. So G5, 100 times more, Internet of Things, all of the technologies and the next sort of whole leap forward. And then how does that change work and society and, you know, also can that help with sustainability development goals and the two-thirds of people who live in Asia who uh, maybe have been doing better jobs with leapfrogging, you know, uh, as we went from G2 to G3 or whatever. So uh, uh, is there any huge positive possibilities of, of AI basically meaning the convergence of everything over the next 10 years that technology could connect together. I, th I think that is what, what, what's, what the real positive potential is. So the next, uh, you know, we're going from 4G technology to 5G technology, uh, which um, has a, a number of benefits beyond speed and such in, in that it'll enable uh, uh, more instantaneous connection. People talk about latency, the word latency, but more instantaneous connection and, and uh, uh, to devices and things out in the real world, which is transform, you know, which, which will transform our ability to do things in smart cities and agriculture, some of the capabilities I talked about even, even more uh, so in healthcare and other areas. So 5G technology is, is a very powerful enabler of more, uh, of more connectivity to happen, combined with, um, with uh, what we call extended reality, which is virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, which we're seeing tremendous advances in and using in uh, factory assembly environments and all sorts of things you know, well beyond in entertainment. And so that's what we believe is it's uh, the combination of 5G providing uh, a connectivity that's uh, hundreds of times faster with instantaneous access, with extended reality getting us past the smartphones, which I view as a transitional technology, to uh, a much different experience of using the technology, powered by AI, giving us better prediction and uh, interaction with the technology. That's, the, that's a, the future, which gets back to my point earlier. It's a more human way to interact with technology. It's us conversing and operating with technology in the world around us that's instrumented in a much more natural way. And uh, that's you know, healthcare and agriculture and, and, uh, and, and the sustainability. There's, there's the tremendous benefits if we wire that together properly. Yeah, I think the most, po and to me the most positive spin often takes the form of ways in which AI contributes to early detection of bad things. Um, that can be health issues, you know, it could eventually be various environmental issues. You know, I, I don't have a long list of examples, but, you know, things that fit the form of early detection, earlier detection of bad things, um, I think of that as that kind of transformative positive effect um, that we can see. The only other thing I'll say on that is if you look at one of my beliefs, uh, others have said this as well, is, is this is kind of like ele an electricity moment where we have an enabling infrastructure of information technology and now AI kind of coming in on top of this. The transistor was invented 70 years ago. And that's what started this whole thing. AI, I believe, is the by far the most powerful of the technologies that's led up to this point. And, um, and uh, that, then that creates uh, you know, a lot of new potential for us in terms of uh, leveraging the technology. And it's about creating this new kind of human level uh, level connection in the way we interact and uh, use the technology. So that's what we see you know, as we look forward to the future. Maybe back there, the gentleman with the glasses in the middle. Yes, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, this is Dr. Utsumi of Grover University System. My first question is, uh, is the AI could be the uh, beyond the singular point. The reason is that that singular point is that up to that point, human intelligence is much higher than AI. After that point, AI becomes a superior than human intelligence. Then, is there any application of the AI to the public policy analysis? The reason for that is that AI itself is, uh, as Professor uh, Ito of the MIT Media Lab said at this uh, point, that is uh, just uh, efficient processing of accumulated data. Then AI cannot handle the uh, creativity. AI cannot handle the imagination. Those two are the intelligence of the human intelligence not artificial intelligence. So, looking for the future, how could be those AI acquire those you know, important uh, factors? That's the point. Yeah, I'll, I'll give, a, give my view on that. I think the, the, so the singularity is, uh, is a term invented by Ray Kurzweil to talk about this point when uh, art artificial intelligence exceeded the, the capacity of the human race was the way he defined it, not just a single human. And the, um, uh, the, the, I think what you said about Joy, uh, I think you talked about Joy Ito, uh, what he said I think is, is right, which is there's certain things that are fundamental human capabilities that we have no idea yet how to solve with AI. Uh, uh, and there's four key dimensions to, you know, four key dimensions we look at, uh, complex problem solving across domains. You know, for example, the, the AlphaGo program that beat Go doesn't know how to play checkers or you know, tic-tac-toe, very simple games. Going across domains is very difficult. So cr complex problem solving, creativity, social emotional response, truly you know, forming a human bond, and sensory perception in a, in a rapid way, which, which, a, admit, which uh, arguably AI is getting better at. Uh, and not that there's other things like common sense and other principles that are very, very difficult to solve with AI. Uh, so, I, so our, my belief and the belief of the, the best AI researchers that I talk to is, is that the singularity is still far, far away and, um, and uh, what we really need to focus on is these narrower situations where we can predict and do pattern matching and things to solve problems that complement what we do as people. The other very strong belief that I have is that the, the singularity sounds uh, scary right now and you might, you know, in terms of a, a, a artificial intelligence that's more powerful than the human race, I believe like any other technology, we're getting smarter, we're evolving as we go in the use of technology, and as we approach the singularity, it's gonna get less and less scary to us, just like a lot of other technologies have as they've materialized. By the time we do get to a singularity, I don't really fear that it's something we won't be able to control ourselves. So that's my perspective. The, the singularity approach makes an assumption that there's a single dimension to intelligence, and I, and I think that's fundamentally wrong. Um, some of the things you were talking about, like creativity, imagination, uh, the, the, you know, there, there's, and, and people who have studied intelligence uh, in, in detail, and I think some very smart philosophers argue that uh, there's just much more to all of the things that we do um, than, in, you know, a single dimension of intelligence that uh, is going to, can, can be measured and at some point, ex, you know, what the machine exceeds uh, th those things. Um, it, 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 uh, it, it, it's an abstract idea that seems appealing, but I think it falls apart when you look at it in, in practical terms. Maybe right there, the gentleman with the black vest. Hi, um, Emmanuel Pisano with AIG. I had a question that maybe touches a little bit on, on stuff that uh, the three of you spoke, but starting with um, what Jed mentioned about the, it's not so much the rate of the technological change, but more the ability of, of society to uh, acquire the skill set to adapt to that change. Um, and, and I'm gonna use 
uh, the role of a, a data scientist in, in my example. I'm, I'm, I'm not one myself, so I, I'm, I apologize if I don't use the correct technical terms, but I remember reading a couple of articles uh, from Forbes and Business Insider and, and other publications where they said that within 10 to 15 years, they, they predict that this relatively new field of data science would itself innovate itself into obsolescence because the machine learning algorithms that are being put into place are already starting to become a little bit more efficient and a little bit better than the data scientists themselves who have been creating them. Uh, so it then becomes an issue of you know, if, if, there's, if there is an aspect of the workforce who's trying to adapt into these new technological fields, and if, if they start going down that path, you know, what happens to the young, the young teenager who's like 10, 11, or 12, who's, who just heard about data science and plans to go down that path, when they come into their you know, their mid-20s and their early 30s, and potentially that fuel is no longer as prevalent or no longer as, as, a, as a required by, you know, by leading technologies. Uh, what happens at that point? So I'm actually gonna give two answers to that, which are almost opposite answers. Um, <laughs> and I think both are, have some truth to them. On one hand, uh, I think it's like already the case that, you know, wh what a data scientist is, you know, in some sense has become obsolete in that, like, the, everyone means something different by it. And so, you know, you can go apply to a data science job at some organization and it could mean something completely different than another organization. In one organization it could mean that you are sort of instrumenting machine learning models, and another could be that you're a business intelligence analyst. Um, so already, like any of these categories um, are so sort of difficult to define, the boundaries are so unclear, um, that inevitably, like what we mean by that is gonna look completely different, you know, five or 10 or whatever years from now. Um, so like, you know, answer number one is like, it is so hard even to define what it is that to say like, will it, how will it change is very difficult. The opposite answer is, you know, data scientists are kind of like what tech people call statisticians with a little extra stuff. Um, and the things that data, the, the skills that data scientists actually need and the thing, the sort of attributes that make a really good data scientist good are very similar to what makes a really good economist good, and very similar to what makes a really good other kind of quantitative social scientist good. And regardless of whether those skills are bundled together in a thing called data science, without question, there will be a huge premium um, on having sharp quantitative ability, um, on knowing when an answer makes sense, on being able to formulate a good question um, you know, knowing when someone else, you know, is making something up. You know, the, the things that really make a good data scientist, you know, are not very different than the skills and aptitudes, you know, that were essential for lots of roles 20 or 50 years ago and will continue to be 20 or 50 years from now. So the, so the opposite answer is, like, the skills that someone needs to do that job well um, the skills and the, the temperament um, and sort of deep aptitude um, will probably be pretty highly correlated with the skills and temperament and aptitude um, to do some kind of very similar job well 10 or 20 years from now. And AI is not about to take over those skills. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I, I would feel very confident telling your kids to study data science. <laughs> the, the field <laughs> itself is going to evolve and change as, as you go. Uh, but it's, it's a great field and is really computational thinking and all the elements around it are going to be around for a long time to come. And uh, we've had extremely high success rates and good success rates in taking data science professionals and, tra and teaching them to do machine learning and, and AI and, and move on to that field as well. So I think it's a great foundation for uh, people to be studying. So we have probably time for two more short questions. So uh, maybe right there. My name 
is Frank Dix. Is on. Frank Dix at PwC. Um, I've heard a number of questions and thought about a theme, and the theme is job security. Um, whether it be driven from uh, anxieties about automation or um, the flight to the coasts, because that's where the jobs are, or um, you know, union busting or contingent work, right? Um, I come from a place that's uh, considered the Rust Belt. That's where I'm from. I live here now. And I know that uh, the, in, the job stagnation there has produced political results because it turned red for the first time where I'm from. So I'm curious to know, uh, back to the policy and politics question, um, you know, whether you have explored, any, any of the panelists have explored the, um, the way in which people feel anxiety compounded on those other issues and, 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 and um, how precisely they feel uh, job insecurity or anxiety as it relates to automation and what the shape of that anxiety is for them. So I think that we recently got some of the best evidence about how people think about economic anxiety um, with the uh, latest, so, uh, sorry, nerd detour for a second. Um, the latest panel of the general um, uh, social survey, long running survey about attitudes, lots of great questions, including one uh, that's essentially an economic anxiety question. Um, they just got this for 2018, they do it every two years, so it's the first wave post-2016 election for which we had these data. Um, yes, the economy has improved a bit um, since then at a sort of similar rate. Um, the change in economic anxiety was enormous um, for Republicans, um, essentially unchanged from two years ago for Democrats. Um, huge differences by race and ethnicity um, where economic anxiety uh, was, I believe, flat for Hispanics, increased slightly for African Americans, plummeted for non-Hispanic whites. Um, so when we talk about like the politics around economic anxiety, um, little of it has to do with what is actually happening in the economy at the moment. Um, and you know, it, it tends to be you know, a, a, a sort of uh, lightning rod for you know, racial worries, um, partisanship, um, lots of other things all at once. So, Immigration also, absolutely. And so I think the, you know, what, sort of how that plays out in politics ends up having to do less with the economy. Um, it's certainly correlated over the long term um, with different kinds of economic opportunities. Um, economic anxiety is certainly higher for people with less education. Um, and, you know, in terms of like, is it tapping into something real? Like, that's the best evidence you know, that economic anxiety is higher people less education, that it really does have something to do with long-term economic opportunities. Um, but it is often swamped um, by lots of things that aren't directly about, you know, the economy or jobs. This is the other thing I'd add to that. Is this, it's, it's a time when I think we need more vision from political and, and business leadership. And the, uh, uh, there was a statistic I just read today. It's, it's, uh, it wasn't a survey we did, but I just read a result that... Uh, said that 69% of American workers, 69% uh, of American workers uh, uh, feel that their employers are not talking to them at all about the impacts of automation and AI, 69%. And, think, and then if you look at the ones who are talking about it, there's, there's, there's very different polar extremes. One uh, CEO, one of the largest financial, one of the largest banks in the world, um, one of the CEOs came out, in, in a, this was about two years ago, in a earnings call and said, we, we expect we won't need half our workforce in, uh, in a couple of years due to the impacts of automation. Some of you may know who that organization was. Created tremendous turmoil, uncertainty, and led to a lot of, lot of disruption, that and other things that happened. Uh, contrast that with uh, the CEO of, of the largest, you know, one of the largest wireless companies in the US, almost at the same point in time said, we're concerned about, uh, we, we, we don't know what the future of AI and automation holds. We, we do know it'll have tremendous impacts on our workforce. We don't know which of you it will, it will impact, but we're gonna invest, invest a billion dollars in our workforce to make sure everybody's well prepared, whether they're gonna be part of our workforce or not. Uh, they, they were almost in the exact same situation and think about the difference in messaging to their people and how it made their employees feel. And, um, and they probably, 
both companies probably were investing about the same amount in their people. But the, the vision and the leadership around this, I think, is, is lacking, and it's even more lacking on the political side. So that's uh, something we're trying to address by educating politicians and others about, uh, about the, the implications of the right way to put policies and programs in place that create more confidence. So one more question, hopefully a yes or no question. Um, <laughs> right there, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Wait, uh, maybe <laughs> yeah. wait for the... Multiple choice. <laughs> <laughs> Steven Garcia. Muay Thai kickboxing and fitness camp. Retired veteran, 32 years, 24 of that was in Japan. So they took me out of paradise and threw me in, in Iraq. My question is, uh, in terms of uh, the senior population, how does that come into play with, with AI? How does it embrace the senior society and what can it do for the senior society? and the uh, caregivers industry? So, th th good question. The, one of the things we see very clearly in our data is older, I'll, I'll start with the still employed seniors. O older workers are probably the ones who are hardest hit. Uh, th they probably have the least personal incentive to invest in learning new skills because they're not gonna be working very many more years. Uh, their employers have little incentive to uh, invest in, in training them. Um, they may have acquired a lot of experience that's really valuable, but when the, when the machines come along, you know, very often uh, seniors tend to be uh, more likely to leave, and once they do leave, they're the ones who see the, the, the heaviest burdens of unemployment and difficulty getting a new job, lower wage when they do. The other side of it is... I, I think, um, you know, we're seeing all over the world uh, countries are, are seeing aging populations. Um, and among the types of jobs that are most resistant to automation uh, are those that involve interpersonal skills, the caring jobs. It's teachers, it's home health care, it's nursing. Um, but you know, ironically, we have, we have this this uh, this divide where those are also some of the least well-paid occupations. I think we may have an opportunity where the technology can be melded. Uh, we can we can provide tools uh, to caregivers that let them do their jobs better, perhaps with less education. Um, so we're seeing some occupations like licensed practical nurses. Uh, where technology has changed uh, the nature of their jobs in ways, uh, given them uh, higher pay, um, more jobs, and, and let, but also lets them play a more uh, vital and important economic role. So I'm hopeful that we can figure out ways to apply AI to uh, some of those sorts of jobs that are going to be important for seniors. Yeah, I agree. Um, the older workers are... Um, most at risk uh, from automation. Um, and I also, I wish that, you know, more than half the attention um, in the media about like what millennials are doing, what millennials want and so on, were shifted instead um, toward seniors. Um, given that, you know, the growth in the senior population um, is much larger in percentage terms than the growth in the age uh, uh, segment represented by younger groups. I mean, and the, the aging of the workforce for, for older folks who will continue to work um, is gonna be one of the biggest transformative factors um, in the labor market over the next decade or so. Um, I do think that the potential benefits of AI, um, particularly around healthcare um, and possibly on transportation um, could also um, have huge benefits uh, for older adults. Um, uh, and so that's the, that's the, that's the more positive version. Um, but so, so much of the energy and technology development is focused um, on um, younger adults um, and sometimes on the relatively trivial problems and needs um, that younger people who work in Silicon Valley have. <laughs> Um, and if there were, you know, I wish there were lots of more venture funds that were focused 
uh, on funding companies uh, that were thinking about the needs not just of older workers but of older adults generally. Um, uh, that, that's one of my top five wishes. Yeah, there, there's tremendous innovation happening in services for the elder population as well. There's a service uh, that, that we helped develop for the National Health Service of the, of the UK as, as an example, which was uh, which is a, uh, an inter interactive AI-powered assistant specifically tuned for senior citizens. They interact differently. They don't want to deal with call center reps whose mission is to get them off the phone as, as quick as they can. They want more help. They want more information. Uh, they, need, they have different types of questions they ask, and this has been hugely successful uh, in improving the satisfaction and care for senior citizens in the United Kingdom, as an example. Another one is, uh, that's been piloted in the U.S. is using uh, soft robotics with senior citizens to, to bond with particularly uh, senior citizens with, uh, with uh, declining uh, cognitive ability. And um, they find that what they found is that the, pers the human caregiver can be augmented by what this fuzzy little robotic device can learn. For One of the examples they talk about it from the research is uh, a patient had fallen down and, um, and they had, had you know, bruised and slightly injured themselves. They wouldn't tell any of their human caregivers. They told their little fuzzy robot. And the fuzzy robot, you know, <laughs> the, the, so the human caregivers knew and could help the person without them feeling embarrassed. You know, which is why they don't want to tell the human caregiver. So there's all sorts of interesting human needs that we can solve better for the elderly populations. Uh, and it was just scratching the surface with some of the technology today. So if I could distill everything into one sort of hopeful message is that, you know, as the use of AI proliferates, the characteristics that make us human become more important. Right? So I think that's, um, that's sort of the summary. So well thank you very much, Jim, Jed, and Paul. And thank you for the discussion. Yeah, thank you.